The sun has gone down at Hangman's Hill and the ghost at Misery Corner isn't walking tonight. So, welcome to the Weird Tales Radio Show, your weekly fix of ghost stories, urban myths, witchcraft, magic and folklore. And now, here's your host, writer, award-winning journalist, best-selling author and sometime werewolf hunter, Charles Christian. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Weird Tales Radio Show. I'm Charles Christian and thank you very much for tuning in again. This week we are talking cryptozoology with Linda Godfrey, well known in the US as a nationally recognised authority on cryptid or hidden creatures. She's a researcher, field investigator and the author of 18 books. She's probably best known for breaking the news story on the upright, wolf-like creature she dubbed the Beast of Bray Road. So let's get on with the interview. So it's my great pleasure to be talking to Linda Godfrey. Hello, Linda. Hello, Charles. So nice to be with you today. We're talking about cryptozoology basically so as the first question is what got you into that area of research well i i like to call myself the accidental werewolf hunter <laughs> and, and and i always temper the word werewolf with the fact that i don't believe that these were actual werewolves but they sort of looked like them so it it, it got that tag but uh, it was back in 91, 92, and I actually was pursuing um, a career for the rest of my life as a cartoonist. And, and I was working very hard, very seriously. I almost got taken on as a sub, uh, sub-cartoonist for the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, mm-hmm. which would have been pretty cool. And then they changed their minds. Um, they had a couple of excuses, but I, I'm pretty sure it was... Um, because I was a woman, I didn't live right in Milwaukee. You know, those were kind of the two things. Yeah. It was almost, almost completely a man's purview to be an editorial cartoonist. The comic strips didn't matter so much. But anyway, I'd, I had offered the newspaper like a year before to do comics and editorial cartoons for free just to get a backlog of, and portfolio. Mm-hmm. And uh, when I, I, I got turned down that one, time I was pretty disgusted and it happened at a time when the editor of the the week which was the county newspaper I had been working for said oh by the way um our reporter Nancy quit do you want a job as a reporter and because he was on pressure to hire somebody fast and they didn't know if I could type or do any of that (laughs) they just had no idea but for some reason, I thought, well, if I'm going to do this, I better not give him a chance to back out. And I said, yes. Yep. And it turned out that the first thing that came to my attention was um, in the realm of animals. And I was working with the county animal control officer um, because there were not only some really vicious puppy mills where there were terrible conditions for puppies being yep. raised, yep. but there were also um, mutilated dog carcasses being found in different parts of the county. And then somebody told me on a it's kind of a tip basis that there were people out on this road outside of Elkhorn, Wisconsin, which happened to be where I was living. And they're saying that they're seeing this upright wolf dog thing that looks like a werewolf. And so I had been visiting the county officer and we talked about the puppy place, puppy place and the mutilated dogs. And then I got my nerve up and said, by the way, have you heard about this thing that they're talking about out on Bray Road? And he said, oh, you mean this? And to my great shock and surprise, he opened his desk drawer and pulled out a manila file folder that was labeled werewolf. <laughs> I kid you not. And he handed it to me, and inside were contact information and statements for a variety of of people who were saying they had seen this thing. And he uh, gave me the information that was in there. I talked it over with my editor, and, and we decided anytime you have a county official with a file folder marked werewolf, that's got to be news. <laughs> that is, yes. <laughs> 
you know, it just has to be. And so nobody else really wanted to touch the story. So I wrote it. And when I went to talk to these people, and I, I was really pretty skeptical. It wasn't that I actually was had been very interested in things like Bigfoot and UFO because my father was. He had all the the Ivan Sanderson uh, sports of field articles and things right, like that yes. on, mm. on Bigfoot. But but werewolves, you know, that just seemed insane. Yeah. And when I started talking to these people, they were all different um, ages, occupations. It was a very diverse, di- diverse little group. And I thought, well, these just don't seem like people who would get together and, you know, pull a hoax because actually the sightings have been going on for a couple of years. It wasn't like they were all in one weekend on that road. Yeah. And they all seemed very serious about what they had seen. You know, they weren't goofy about it or laughing. Some were almost in tears trying to ta- talk about it because it was such a shocking thing to them. You know, and, you know, and some of them, it was very close to their cars. Um, very often people would see it while driving home after dark, although there were plenty of daylight sightings too. Many from um, a, a really close distance so they had a very good look and I knew it wasn't Bigfoot because they were describing something completely canine with Mm -hmm. pointy ears on top of the head um, a muzzle like a German shepherd or a wolf a wolf a a wolf type tail Um, it had in most descriptions they said it had kind of matted dark brown fur like it had just been out you know full of burrs and things in the wild and so that, that was all very consistent, and uh, I talked about it with the editor, and we're like, well, they'll have fun with it for a week or two, and then it'll go away, you know, and it was New Year's Eve weekend, 1991-1992, which is a pretty slow news time, mm-hmm. you know, nobody schedules anything for that, so yes. they gave me the whole center fold spread, uh, it was kind of a broad sheet type of newspaper, and I just did sort of a quick sketch, I wasn't... I've often said I would have taken more time on the drawing if I'd, well, first, if I'd had time. And second, um, you know, if it, we just didn't expect that it was going to be seen by so many people and still remains the icon. Um, So anyway, and I had named it Beast of Bray Road because I did not think it was a werewolf. Um, I just didn't know what it was. And by the way, it walked on its hind legs. I think I left out that very, very important um, item. Yeah, it, it walked and ran and jumped on its hind legs, as if it were ac- just accustomed to doing that. And one woman even saw it kneeling in a position that canines usually can't take by the side of the road and holding some type of furry roadkill up to its mouth, using its palms upturned, which if you yeah. ever try and feed your dog a snack and it does that, you better run. Cause it's, <laughs> it's, you know, it's not normal uh, canine behavior. Yeah. So, we ran the paper and the world just kind of exploded. And that was before, I always have to remind my younger listeners, uh, there wasn't always an internet. You know, the internet existed in some kind of prototype at that at that period in history. Yeah, that's about four or five years ago be- before the first uh, browsers turned up right. and it really took right. off. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. So it wasn't like people could just go to my homepage. Mm. They had to contact... By snail mail or tel- telephone. Telephones were these boxy things that sat on your desk or hang on the wall. Yep. And, and, you know, for people who are unfamiliar with what they were, and it's surprising how many are. So they had to find the phone number of, or the address of the newspaper. So they were going to some trouble. And this wasn't just like a one day thing, it just kept building and building. And um, the next thing I knew, all the Milwaukee and Madison and Chicago TV stations were there, and then the the very old Inside Edition, yep, and uh, different shows like that started coming out, and they just never stopped. And the more information I gave out, of course, the more people came forward and told their stories, and it was really just kind of a crazy thing. Now I worked for that newspaper as a reporter and artist and cartoonists for 10 years. And the whole time, it just kept going. And I, I began to think of myself as sort of the, the keeper of the lore, because right from the very beginning, I knew there was something more to it than the usual animal sightings. You know, it was just too, lo- too long-lived, too, too consistent. Um, 
it, yeah. it, there was something to it, you know, and I thought, well, it could be that there's some local subspecies that somehow adapted to walk upright for some reason that's for them. I call that my indigenous dog man theory. Mm-hmm. And I, ha- I had a sketch of what that would look like in my first book. But the first book did not get written until um, like 2003. So it was 10 years be- yeah. that finally went by before I thought, well, I better put this stuff down somewhere because it's just it was already starting to get distorted in terms of what people had seen and done. And what I really wanted it to do was remain consistent so that if anyone wanted to study it in the future, they'd have the actual facts, you know, and, and would know what what the real deal was. Yeah. So I I had a different book to, to write first. I wasn't sure that anybody would publish a book about canines that, that looked like werewolves, ran like men. You know, it just sounded too crazy. So I went to a regional publisher in Madison and... Um, gave them a, another story I had, which was about, um, it was called The Poison Widow, a true story of sin, strychnine, and murder. And it was it, and it was completely true book um, that happened, but nobody had known about it because it happened back in the 1920s, and it was considered so sordid and shocking that this woman had a, an affair with a college student that she and her husband were boarding at their house. And then she and the college student killed the husband with strychnine and all, and would have killed her four children, too. It's a wild story. Yeah. And so they, they liked that. They took that. It went well. And they said, well, what else have you got? And that's where I said, well, would you believe werewolves? And they kind of, I could just see my, the, the, um, publishing editor looking, raising his eyebrow, you know, thinking about that, but they took it and that book is still going pretty strong. It's in its second edition. Is that The Beast of Bray Road? The Beast of Bray Road, Tailing Wisconsin's Werewolf. Right. 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 And yeah. the second, yep, the second edition um, is exactly like the first one. I changed publishers yeah. when the first one went out of business, but, um, but it's still available. And then that touched off another flurry and it just you know it just kept going now i i now have 18 books published counting a fantasy novel and um one one other i'm trying to think of what it was but it's 18 and i have a um middle school age fantasy i want to get out that's done it's just sitting ready to go to the editor and i i don't know if i'm going to do any more on the other creatures but the Mm. last the last four have been with um, Penguin um, Random House. That's yeah. it. For some reason, the random wasn't coming. Yeah. Yeah. Penguin Random House, which have been great. And the last four have been with them. And the last, in this last most recent book, which came out in July, and it's called I Know What I Saw, Modern Day Encounters with Monsters of Newer Religion and Ancient Lore. I had so much material in chapters... 10 and 11 about the black mystery cats that I know everyone in the UK is very familiar mm. with. Mm. Um, that it ended up being a film. Uh, my son is a filmmaker and it just so happens that my uh, one and only uncle passed on and left just enough to do like a very, very sh- slim, slim shoestring um, version of the events of those things. And especially... The, the crazy part is that in, in uh, investigating this, I found that there were more than 50% of many of the sightings, especially one area in western Wisconsin, where mountain lions, known to be returning to the east, had black fur. And that's supposed to be impossible. Right. Yeah. You know, it's not, that's not supposed to happen. So um, that became a separate entity of its own. And it's really just coming out. In fact, we just um, received top documentary award from a film festival in northern Wisconsin called the Midwest Weird Fest. It's run by, <laughs> a, a, by a very nice uh, uh, Australian man. His name is Dean Bertram, Dr. Dean Bertram. It was a wonderful thing. And so it's kind of run us into this whole new realm and there are a lot of people hearing about this now yeah. from the, the movie that would not otherwise. So from that one little visit back in the early nineties yeah. to and and that 
uh, Manila file folder, it's just progressed and progressed. It's been almost 30 years now. Yes. You know, quite yeah. quite a while. So it's ended up being un- unwittingly the focus of my life. But it just, you know, it gets its claws in you and you can't, it does, does not let go. Yeah. Uh, and the film you're talking about, I believe that, is that called Return to Wildcat Mountain? Wisconsin's yes. Black Panther Nexus. Yes. Yep. And you can find it on YouTube, I believe. Well, we've actually transferred it, it transferred it from YouTube and it's it's better to go to our fam or Facebook, which is the same thing, basically. Return to Wildcat Mountain, or you can search for White Lhasa Studios, named after our little Lhasa Lhasa Opso dogs that we right. had. During the time, but it's White Loss of Studios is the other. Or just go to lindagodfrey.com and click on the big picture and it'll take you to everything. Right. Okay. So that's where we are at the beginning. So let's go a bit more to the werewolf element because there's obviously one view that werewolves are really some aberrant or perhaps cryptid unknown species of wolf or hound or something. And then there's the other view that they are the semi-supernatural, the sort you see in the movies where somebody's bitten by one and they turn into a werewolf with with special, lots of dramatic special movie effects (laughs) um, on a full moon. But there seems, you know, there's one, there's, you know, there's this paranormal shapeshifter and then there's another idea that really they are just a critter, but a critter that we don't understand hasn't been properly investigated. Where do you stand on your definitions of them? Well, kind of all of those. (laughs) Uh, Oh, right. Fine. (laughs) Yeah. Um, No, it's just that after several years, I started realizing that they, they sort of dropped into subgroups, you know, and... It wasn't that there there wasn't really any evidence that they were doing the slow motion fur growing, twisting and turning, uh, turning yeah. all their muscles, um, the fur, you know, just getting bushy around the face, um, you know, the fangs actually literally growing out of regular human teeth, you know, and then evidently popping back. Um, that you know, that's the, the type that seems least likely of any of it to me, but. Um, when there, there, there does happen to be a segment that transforms, but it's more like the blink of an eye. It's more like a projection. It's more like a partly being in one spot and another spot at the same time. And I started trying to read books on um, quantum physics because they, uh, all the, the world's finest um, professors and, and doctors and people who study physics of any kind now pretty much agree that all the formulas not only allow for but kind of demand for there to be other universes or realms or mm. um, spirit worlds or whatever you want to call yeah. them. At yeah. least at least 11 is, you know, are postulated. And, you know, I started thinking about energy types and any type of energy we have, light, for instance, there isn't just no light and light, you know, where, where it's completely brilliant. There's a spectrum of light. Same with sound. You know, you have ultrasound and infrasound from one scale to the other. There are dog whistles that our dogs can hear, but we can't, you know, so we know they're there. And why wouldn't everybody, everything follow that pattern? You know, it just seemed likely to me that, that it could. And some of the Native American related creatures that are wolf-like. Yes. um, Are the skinwalker is one that I get asked about a lot. For instance, it's supposed to, they're, they're, they are more related with um, what people call magic or sorcery for lack of a better word. A lot of others would call it energy manipulation. Mm -hmm. And I've actually witnessed this firsthand from um, a Native American medicine woman who didn't say she was going to do this, but we were talking, and for a moment, her eyes started changing color. 
Lord. She had uh, dark, very dark brown eyes. And as she talked, they turned to a lighter color, a, a, a medium blue, and then they turned to a very light pale blue. And mm. I'm, <laughs> you know, I didn't know if I should be saying anything or acknowledging it or what. And then they just went back the other way. And, you know, she never said anything and I never said anything. And a few hours later, I couldn't stand it anymore. And I said, you know, I just have to ask you this. I, I don't know if I should. But, and she said, oh, about my eyes turning color. <laughs> so that was, that was kind of a shaky. I mean, that meant she knew it and she was testing yeah. me to see if I would see it, I think. You know, and there is, there's another book. It's kind of hard to find, but it's um, about a medicine woman named Agnes Whistling Elk. And she has a, a woman for um, an apprentice, sort of. And they're talking about that sort of transformative thing. And all of a sudden, Agnes Whistling Elk had these, there was her face, and then there was the face of a bear and a wolf and a mountain lion, you know, and the apprentice is just sitting there staring, and and then when Agnes returns to her own look, she says, how did you do that? And she said, well, it's just what I choose to project. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, and so you start getting witness reports like that, and it's kind of changed my thinking about it, and, you know, it, it also, it makes sense. If you think about humans, um, let's let's say that, that uh, you know, somebody's Uncle Joe is sitting there and he's um, just regular, natural Uncle Joe. He's all physical. And then he passes away. And a few days later, you see this image of Uncle Joe and he's talking to you, but his hand is going right through the chair. He's somewhere else and yet he's still has, um, you know, some sort of energy that tells you who he is and what mm -hmm. he looks like. So, and almost every, it's a very high percentage. I can't remember the exact number right offhand, but it's, it's a very high percentage of people are shown by polls to believe that there are such things as either ghosts or other dimensions where our loved ones go and maybe will go after death. Yes. You know, so, um, why wouldn't that be true for, say, an animal? Mm -hmm. You know, you mm -hmm. know, and you would see a wolf. It's all wolf. But then you see these other ones that have characteristics. Like, for instance, the ones that are often uh, native, um, native area based because I, these, they're very often seen close to uh, native lands um, these days. But they just, they have the one normal human look, mm -hmm. and then they have something that's different. Maybe it's a combination. Maybe it is a ball of light that then coalesces into a form that you can recognize. Mm -hmm. People mm -hmm. see these things all the time. I've mm -hmm. seen one myself with two witnesses at the same time. So there are different forms of energy, and we don't really still understand how they affect the ways that we live and move and have our be our, be our being, you know. And I'm a Christian. I tend to um, really come down on the conservative side most of the time. And that I went to the Bible and realized there are transformations like that completely full through the whole Bible, you know. And, and people can take different views. I don't want to put too fine a point on it, but... Mm -hmm. um, it's it's just you go to any world religion, and that's what you'll find. You'll find transformations of humans to ghostly humans or humans that look kind of like humans and animals put together, and it's universal. So you're putting down that werewolves are a thing, um, as opposed to the usual, you know, it was a some kind of um, mass hysteria delusion or something, that they're real, but they probably aren't the things in movies, but they may well be some kind of parallel universe-type creature that interfaces with our world. It's, it's possible. Um, 
I, I do think there's a difference between the things that people were seeing out on Bray Road and the overtly um, otherworldly yeah. things. Because the ones they were seeing out on Bray Road, and probably 90% of the ones people report today from all over the country, that's the big thing I learned after the first newspaper story went out, was it was something that was all over this country, Canada, South America, and even Europe. And the thing was that this type, which is usually seen either watching people from the woods or running across the road while while they're um, driving or looking up at them from the ditch while they're driving, are not they're not doing anything that is not perfectly according to the laws of physics by walking on their hind legs. Any mammal can walk on its hind yeah. legs if it is trained or motivated yeah. to do so. Yes. You know, that's not a magical thing. Mm. It's just a different, real different behavior. Um, what did often strike people as weird is that if they were close enough, they said, um, and they say this over and over again, it was as if it was trying to make eye contact with them. Some called it having a stare down. Mm -hmm. And that it was somehow projecting a message to them of um, to, to be careful around them to not tell anybody or it would come get them, um, to say it could jump on their car, um, get out of here, this is my place, that kind of mm. thing, which is weird. Now, you know, that's, and, and they said it wasn't like hearing words or anything. It was just that was the impression they got. Now, you, I try to always put my uh, reporter hat back on. You could say that there are um, instincts that we have that can somehow read predators emotions because we've lived on earth with um you know the with wolves and mountain lions and things for many 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 years and in order for humans to survive they'd have to kind of be able to read what the big predator standing over there was going to do to them you know ac according to its its uh body movements and maybe its growls whatever it was doing you know so it's with all of these, it's not overtly, um, I don't want to say paranormal, but, but that seems to be the thing. Yeah. But you go back to the Middle Ages. Oh, the other thing is that these ones now, to my knowledge, don't hurt people. I, it, there have been some, a few claims that this has happened. I've only had one person have a major um, injury from one the whole time that I've been collecting, maybe, maybe one more. Yeah that have been personally reported to me. There have been some other people who've also had some reported, you know, but um, I like to really focus on the ones I've investigated myself. And this one was a man in um, Canada who was out trail walking, and he said all of a sudden he came face to face with what looked like a wolf standing on its hind legs. And he became very frightened, like just, you know, panic-stricken. He didn't have a gun or anything like that with him. And he said he tried to move around, kind of get past him on the trail, and it was coming toward him, too. They were at sort of an impasse, like people with who were each pushing a grocery cart, and, yeah. uh, you, know, you know, you bump the cart because no, neither knows which way to go. That's what he felt like. And he said it, it lunged to get past him with its mouth kind of open and snarling, and it ripped open the skin on his flank and, and side. Um and he said he went to the had to go to the hospital for stitches, left right away. The creature just kept going, kept on going. And they asked him what did it, and he said a bear because he didn't want to be made fun mm -hmm. of. So, and that's a very very common witness reaction yeah. too. But if you go back to you know um, the UK and Europe and um, the the more northern countries back in the Middle Ages, when people who were thought to be werewolves were being actually executed in gruesome ways. Mm. You know, you had that whole era of the witch's hammer where um, there was an inquisition. And whether or not that person had done it was hard to understand. But there were lots of people and animals actually being killed. Sheep and sheep herders being chief among them. Um, you had beasts uh, just rampaging through churches, which are supposed to be um, sacri sacred places where these things can't go, and yet they were. So there was a whole different level of action and behavior. And then there was also um, 
a code by which people could study and become these things. And they were believed to be transformational. They would use um, the pelt or the skin from a wolf if that's what they wanted to turn into. And then they'd have to have special other ingredients and do different ritual things. And then they themselves could turn into these creatures, yeah. it was believed. And then in that state, they would go and predate around the, the countryside. Yeah. Cause great havoc. So, you know, over time, that whole concept of what is the werewolf has evolved in its own way. You're listening to the Weird Tales radio show with Charles Christian. Yes, I mean, obviously, we don't have them now, but wolves were a problem in the Middle Ages and uh, what people still call the Dark Ages right through mm-hmm. until, well the, well, the French still had problems with wolves as the famous story of the Beast of Gervan, yes. uh, which was in the um, 18th century, so, so relatively mm-hmm. late. And, of course, slightly messing up it, you did have the Vikings and they had their berserkers and there were two sorts, yes. <laughs> those who wore the bear skins and took mm-hmm. various drugs and thought they had the power of bears and those who wore the wolf skins and had a similar view. And um, uh, mm-hmm. you can certainly see how people would think, well, this is magic. I can't believe this crazed killing machine in a, in a wolf skin is a human being. It's not acting like a human being. Um, so you've got all of these things and um, lodging in the memory plus real wolves running around the place. How have you found then your witnesses to these stories? Because obviously one of the problems with any form of loosely put paranormal investigation Mm -hmm. is that you get the people who genuinely believe what they think they saw and then you get the sort of, I suppose, to put it politely, the nutters and the sort of attention seekers and uh, people jumping on the bandwagon, etc. You know, they're going to get featured in the local newspaper. Uh, you know, or they they were drunk at the time. Uh, we've had incidents in the UK where people have reported mysterious creatures, but it's noticeable it's been during the sort of Christmas party season. And you think, well, we're, <laughs> there's a bit of alcohol going on here. Um, how, how have you found them when you've been dealing with your witnesses? Well, they find me. Right. I don't ever go out looking for them, you know, because there I have more than enough, um, more than I can handle just to, to write about and investigate the ones that... Um, come to me without going and having huge long lines. I actually have a file folder right now that I'm trying to get um, the time to kind of just go through it. And 10 years at a newspaper writing one to three feature stories about people a week. And they weren't all just like, you know, who's playing the piano for granny at the nursing home or anything like that. I was writing stories um, about social issues that, um, had to be pretty carefully watched, you know, to to uh, separate people's opinions from fact and, um, you know, keep both sides um, both well spoken for, but also not, not overly spoken for. So, you know, it can be a tricky thing, but I had had 10 years of practice at it. And so you kind of get this sense for when someone's fooling you and, and when they aren't. So that was one thing. But then... Um, as the internet progressed back to that handy little machine, it became easier and easier to investigate people's backgrounds and to check out facts that they told me, you know, and if they gave me a a story where I could see they were, um, they were not correct on major things that they should have known. Well, that would be, you know, that that would go in the, in the wastebasket right there. Um, you know, and I also just just little things when I'm interviewing um, you know, most people who do that for a living, you know, know what I'm talking about. But um, it's much, much easier to really decide whether someone is telling you the truth or not these days. 
And most of the people that get a hold of me will say right up, you know, you can tell my story, but don't use my name. I don't want, Mm -hmm. you know, I don't want anybody to know who I am. They're not in it for the glory. They don't want money. Um, People usually just say some form of all I wanted to do was tell this to someone who wouldn't say I was crazy. You know, that's the main thing to most of them. And that's why um, the title of my last book, I Know What I Saw, that's where that's where that title came from, because that's what people say to me verbatim. You know, you can tell me I didn't see it, but I know what I saw. And I have had some experience seeing things myself. So I have to believe them because, um, you know, I believe myself. And I if as long as they're reasonable and and checking out, I, I will believe usually what they say, too. But um, these things happen when they're least expect expected. And. There are so many different things now for people to see that they can realize is something out of the ordinary. For instance, um, until a few years ago, nobody had any real idea how many mountain lions have managed to reproduce, though backed into that. Um, They were virtually obliterated by the 1930s. And some of them were hiding out in Florida and some um, down around Arizona. And then they started moving back as soon as um, conditions permitted. And now, uh, before, people would have totally believed if you saw a mountain lion um, on your street or neighborhood or where you're um, fishing or whatever. And now it's become, especially the black ones, almost equal to seeing um, an apparition of a Bigfoot. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, or even a a solid Bigfoot. You know, it's all put into that realm. And so um, I actually have also interviewed some um, Native Native American medicine people from different tribes who generally say not they don't all believe exactly the same thing. But what I've been told most about these uh, the large cats is that um, by and large, the the light brown, light tan ones you see are just the regular mountain lions, but the black furred ones can be like um, an otherworldly, this world hybrid. You know, right. between the two, it can right, yes, go back. And that's what I've been also told about the upright um, canines, which I think is a better descriptive term than than werewolf. And the Bigfoot is that they all come from mainly the spirit world but they can come here and do whatever it is that they do Um, it seems that they all procreate here that may be one of the big reasons I don't know but um, for instance I actually spotted a mountain lion it wasn't a black one it was a, a beige one a couple of weeks ago in a green belt conservancy area that kind of circles the entire town that I live in and connects to a river so it's a great habitat yeah but I was just out taking my afternoon walk and walking across this road laid over some culverts um, where this marsh grass was was uh, kind of rampant. And I, I noticed a, a movement in the marsh grass and I looked closer and it was the head of a mountain lion. And it was down below me, so I was in a fairly safe position. I, I don't know. If it had wanted to get me, it probably could have. But it didn't see me at first because it was turned away from me. And its head was would come up every once in a while. And if you've ever seen like a dog or a cat, they've got something that they want to chew or pull off, or maybe a, a, a piece of meat or a, some kind of toy. And they'll hold it down with one paw and then they take it in their teeth and pull up with their teeth to kind of chew it, chew it off. That's what this thing was doing. And the reason I was looking down there was, as soon as I turned the corner on the block, I heard this horrible sound of a house cat screaming. Mm-hmm. And it was definitely a house cat because you could hear the, the meow in, as it blended into the scream. And it got louder and louder as I had approached this culvert. And I realized I was watching a mountain lion, not a huge one, but I'd say maybe a, a female or a two-year-old one eating a house cat. Right. There is, I and I I could see as I stopped and watched, um, I could see the tail every now and then, which is very unique in a cougar. Um, very long, round. It makes this little um, hump, humpy position. I could see it um, continuing to pull up 
meat or something off of yep. this cat. And every time, every time it did, the cat would yell louder. I could see um, it turned around when it was finished because uh, it had it had spotted me, and it did something quickly with with the um, carcass, and then it turned around and I could. I could see its full body then because it was using its hind legs to um, shove flying chunks of dirt and stuff and, and grass over where the carcass had been. Right, yeah. And my, my husband and I went down there late, later and collected scat. And there's, it's a very unique, the mountain lions have a very unique looking scat. I won't um, gross out your listeners <laughs> with the description. But, and, and he agreed because he had seen it. Um, when he was stalked by a cougar one time himself in the woods, he's a very um, uh, out, outdoor going person. He loves the outdoors. That he's a hunter and a fisher, and and so we had that proof. It wasn't just my imagination, but my whole point is, people still look at me like I'm crazy when I I tried to warn the neighbors and they said, "Hey, keep your cats in." I saw a cougar down there mm-hmm. in, the, in the marsh grass, and they know. And this is about the third sighting there's, they've been. There's been in this town, one of which even made the newspaper. Um, that one was was a um, buff one. The other two are black. So they know it's been in the news. They know the other ones are around, but they still cannot accept it. And that's you know the the human will to believe what it wants to believe is I think one of the strongest forces in the universe. <laughs> yes, or d- <laughs> deny the evidence of things it doesn't want to believe in. Possibly another way yes, of doing it. That's a good way to look at it, yeah. right. Now, one of the things I'm looking at um some of the notes I've got here, what is a dire dog and its difference from a dire wolf? Yeah, this is something that um Back from the very beginning when people started calling me to, in 1992 to say that they had seen um, the, this upright uh, wolf-like creature, um, some of them said, you know, it wasn't anything real or that I'd seen before, but I knew that it was somehow, you know, a canine. Mm-hmm. And they were just, they were, but it wasn't walking on hind legs was the big difference. And and also, they were huge. You know, they were saying um, it was like the size of a bull calf or a Shetland pony, you know, which is really big for any kind of yes. dog. And those those are still the two. People still report it. I've got various pictures of things that uh, – of actual um, um, black – young black cattle that have been mutilated and stuff. But those those are the main descriptions that it would give for the height. Um, the rest of the – Sounded very much like the the wolf type of thing, and they were actually bigger than the uh, the dire wolves were when they were around. Now the dire wolves haven't been extinct that long; maybe ten thousand years is what they're supposed to be. And we have many hundreds of great skeletons, and and even um, the La Brea tar pits, you know, has yeah. uh, saved. More than just the skull, the skull and this, and the excuse me, skeleton. Mm-hmm. So we have lots to look at to know exactly what size those were. These things are bigger, and the weird thing about them is they're not content to sit in the ditch and look at you. They chase cars. They try to run them off the road. I had one report not too long ago where it actually succeeded in pushing a light truck off of the road during a snowstorm. And luckily, they managed to get back up on the road. But um, this happens over and over and over again. And people will say, I was driving 35 miles an hour. It was following me at the same clip, you yeah. know, keeping up and um, even got up to where it was even with me in my driver's seat. And then I could see that it was um, at the shoulder level of it was 36 inches off the ground. Yeah. And I just when I was putting this book together. I was trying to include things that could have been in various types of lore and myth. Um, and these things struck me as belonging to that category, but they were so big and so different. I had never really um, put them in, you know, put them in any books as, as a feature unto themselves. And I realized I had enough that I needed to do that. And of course they didn't all fit in the book either, but, um, I decided to call them dire dogs because 
they weren't all completely wolf-like. Some did um, seem to have a, a slightly shorter nose, not not like a um, human nose or or even a a Bigfoot, but they were still they were identifiable as canine, but they were huge and they liked to bump into cars. I've even had a few people mention them following them home and then like throwing their sides against the house, slamming the house on one side. So yeah, it's, it's kind of a, it's a different category of things that look canine, but who knows what they really are. Yeah. Right. My job is to, rec- is to record, you know, I'm trying to get these things down and, uh, cause I'm not going to be able to go on forever yes. <laughs> <laughs> by any means. You know, I, I, and I'm, I'm happy that other people are finally taking up the banner because until maybe, I don't know, five, six years ago at, at least, um, people in the uh, cryptozoological world were saying, no, it's just a, um, a Bigfoot with a long snout and, or a Bigfoot with a long snout, um, upright ears and that walks on its toe pads like a dog. Well, you describe it that way, and you've got a dog or a wolf to me, not a snowed Bigfoot, which is an entirely different thing yeah. in my view. Yeah. And I've, like I said, I've seen them. So, um, you know, I'm as, as good a witness as the people I interrogate, I guess. And I did tell anybody for a couple of years after that happened because I was like, thinking, oh, they're just going to say, well, of course, you know, now she's seeing him because she's got to have something for her next book. And that's just not true. Yeah. And I felt I I felt um, disingenuous not coming forth with my own story when I was encouraging people who were sure about what they had seen and had um, informative encounters to share their stories with the world. You know, I thought, well, if they're going to, I have to. As well as dealing with, if you like, sounds a bit of an oxymoron, but um, the well-known, almost conventional cryptids, such as werewolves, Bigfoot and the like. Mm -hmm. You've also got an interest in things like Slenderman, I believe. Yeah. um, Well, one of the, when the editor at Tartar Penguin, which is um, the older combination of of the publisher, um, before they merged... Um, he said, I, I want you to write a book for me that has um, that that talks about all of the newer sorts of um, paranormal or otherworldly type things that people are seeing and show whether there is or isn't a big connection to the things of myth and fairy tale and lore, you know, that we've all heard all our lives and, you know, just see if there is anything that that really matches and. And um, that, so that's where that came from. I had this directive to specifically look for that in this book. The thing is, some of them, you know, like, like Slender Man, there's not a lot to know because he was basically um, a figure of fiction that was made up on um, the Internet, what they call creepypasta, yes. where groups will form and um, one will start a creepy story and the next one will add to it. You know, yeah. and, and Slender Man was one of those that grew out of that. And there have always been, um, he joins a larger group of strange men that often there's just a silhouette and a tall hat. Um, some people call them hat men or stick men. Um, stick men is also a, applicable to a type of Native American uh, sort of skinny creature. You know, they're always, um, there's something called uh, a- apple twitches, apple, apple twitch, something like yeah. that. That's a um, one in the, the the Native American Eastern tribal lore. And it's almost as if they also come from another realm. You know, they you, you seldom see features on them. You know, it's just this outline. It's like they're um, two-dimensional. And that gets into another category. I don't, I don't really have a lot to link them to, you know, in ancient lore. But there are other things coming out that, um, such as shadow wolves and shadow people, that's another category of them, where they see the outline form of a wolf or a shadow uh, very strongly, but there's no there there. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, it's, it'll turn sideways and there's nothing there when it turns sideways, which makes you think, 
that would be a two-dimensional being. Yes. And and in fact, I'm getting more and more of those that look like uh, the shape of wolves, and they're usually twice the size or more. Uh, some are just actually giant. And a lot of them, they've been coming from this area of Wisconsin called the Kettle Moraine um, State Forest. There's a southern unit and, and a northern unit. And most of them have been by people totally unaware and unbeknownst to each other. Uh, some are a couple years apart. Um, they're seen by this the northern ridge of this uh, state forest. There's a, a highway that runs through it. And I've got three or four now that have seen that exact thing. I also have, um, I think it's in American Monsters, either that or Monsters Among Us, um, a, a family, a whole family that saw one of these black shadow wolves at the edge of a woods by their, their yard and their gardens. And there were, um, I think, several fa- seven family members, and I interviewed two of them. And they were just alike in what they said. They were convinced. And it was um, something that was looking at everybody. And when one of them noticed it, um, I think it was the, the grandmother. I mean, it's a great visual. The grandmother grabbed a, a broom or a rake or something and took off chasing it. She wasn't going <laughs> to let it get her kids or her grandkids. And this is in a very rural Tennessee area. And when she did that, um, it turned around sideways. And that's when they saw it had no width. Right. Yeah. You know, and they, and they could, it was two dimensional. Just just and like a shadow, that, indeed. Yes. That's. Yeah. 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 So um, I call those shadow wolves. So uh, it's. It's really interesting. Just when you think you have things figured out, something else really weird happens. Is there a sort of scientific theory to explain it? You know, if you like to debunk it, that it's something to do with the human brain seeing something but misinterpreting it? I mean, a bit like that thing where you can sometimes see, you're sure you see something in the, on the corner of your vision. Uh, right. There's nothing actually there. I mean, is it, is is there anything like that? Or well, if it's one person, I would certainly consider that. If more than one person, and in fact, like seven, are all looking and watching and seeing the same thing at the same time, um, that's a lot harder to prove because then you mass delusion is really unless it's something that is worked up to and known ahead of time, um, like the all the. Um, the Mary sightings, you know, at, at sacred religious sites. Yes. Um, this is people just going about their business. And then they all, you can't say they had a mass delusion. And no, that's never been shown to be possible. I've researched that. Um, there can be shared experiences when people are on some types of, of um, substances. Um, yes. Certain, certain mushrooms yes. and you know, South, South American vines and things yeah. like that. But they're a little different too. Um, you know, I won't get into that. But no, I I think when you've got a bunch of people saying the same thing and taking actions and all, you know, coming to the same conclusion of what they saw, um, I don't I don't think you can dismiss that very lightly. It's it's heavily into the mystery section. Yeah. What about puckwidges? Puckwidges. Yeah, uh, or puckwidges, different ways of, of spelling it. Um, yeah. They have to do with, there's another, a whole other category that I kind of put together, although they aren't always exactly like, but sightings of what we might call elves or our Native Americans, especially in the eastern half of the U.S., um, would call puckwidges. They, they look a lot like small people, very similar to the elves in that they, they're small people that you um, have to be careful of because if you offend them, um, you know, they'll find ways to pay you back, um, sour your cow's milk or, um, you know, do, do, do bad little things, but they can be helpful if you have them as, as allies. And they are described in different ways, especially the Native Americans will usually describe them as a very small person, you know, maybe a foot to two feet high at the most. And some of them believe that um, they travel in these um, in orbs. Many people, in, including myself, have seen white or colored orbs, maybe from a baseball size to basketball size, traveling quickly through the air, and then they slowly melt out into a, a human form. And it might be very small. 
um, so, uh, some Sasquatches are reported to be able to do that too. It's sort of a different thing, but the Pukwudgies, um are that's the most general view of them is that they look like little human beings, and you have to be very careful not to disrespect one. So, and I'm, I'm sh- I'll just say one real, real quick thing, which is I'm sure you can realize all the parallels to all the European and um, Icelandic and and Swedish and yes. UK, you know, all all of the same creatures that you have, and and again, yes. these are universal all over the world too. Yes, I mean, with the North American example, it is interesting that a lot of the accounts come from, if you like, the eastern states that were the first settled by Europeans, mm-hmm. and that they brought their possible you know one one suggestion is they brought their beliefs yes. in the fae the uh, little people elves right. whatever you want to call them uh, they brought them with them right. but it does appear that the native americans who were already there uh already had similar beliefs right they were there but they i i do believe there was some kind of cross breeding between them and actually that's i have another finished novel it's a young adult about just that sort of thing happening the with the creatures coming from Europe and and uh, it's called the the Red Hat series. Um, there's there's kind of a string. Of, so one of, one of these days I'll get that one edited and out there too because it's it's done and ready to go. But it it runs along those very same lines. That's kind of the the idea of it. Okay then. Well, uh, thank you ever so much for your time. And um, good luck with your researches. Well, thank you. Thanks very much for having me. And, and thanks to all your listeners. And uh, I appreciated the, talk, the chance to talk about my favorite subject. Take care now. Bye. Bye-bye. And that's it. We're out of time again. It just remains for me, Charles Christian, to say thank you very much for listening in. And I hope you'll join me again the same time next week when we'll have another packed show taking you into the realms of the paranormal. Till then, stay well, stay weird, stay different. Good night. Black Shuck, the demon dog of East Anglia, is baying at the moon. Which means it's time for us to go. You've been listening to The Weird Tales Radio Show with Charles Christian, your weekly fix of ghost stories, urban myths, witchcraft, magic and folklore. You can keep in touch with us online at www.weirdtalesradio.com by email to weirdtales at icloud.com and on Twitter at Christian Uncut. Join us again next week for another edition of The Weird Tales Radio Show. Good night.